expounded upon from Lincoln or from someplace else? Are they all directly from Lincoln? These are all drawn from Lincoln. Okay, so. With a little help from me. <laughs> you know, I mean, he didn't sit down and, I mean, Lincoln's not a political scientist. He doesn't sit down and write a treatise. Correct. He never gives a lecture on, the, on political theory. Uh, so I'm looking at these things and I'm saying, all right, here's the pattern. The, here, here's the assumed pattern underneath what he says here, what he says there, what he says someplace else. So I'm bringing it all together, like I'm bringing, you know, like, like, like uh, the grocery store brings all of the farmer's produce from many different places yeah. to one place. That's my, that's my job as a history person. Okay. Right. I was wondering if there were tablets in, in, you know, with carvings on them involved. <laughs> Um, the, he would have made my, my life much simpler if he had, in fact, given us a nice point-by-point -point organized system. But on the other hand, I've, I've had a great deal of entertainment, shall we say, in working through Lincoln's, the, the vast bulk of Lincoln's writings, and finding the things that he says about democracy. I mean, he, in a lot of ways, he says as much as he says. He takes it for granted. He's, he's not assuming that he's got people out there he has to persuade, and certainly he's not going to be giving them a quiz at the end, all right? So he can assume certain things, but he also is conscious of how, in his own time, people have come to question, especially the people who will form the Confederacy. They've come to question this thing called democracy. And he wants to recall them, but he wants to recall the people of the free states as well. Because the Confederacy is going to resist this with force. How should the northern states, the freeze, how should they respond to this? Should they respond by descending to exactly the same tactics and thus, in a way, prove that the Confederates were right? I mean, one, it seems to me that one of the greatest proofs of Lincoln's commitment to democracy is not in something he actually said, but in something that he didn't do. And that is, he didn't cancel the election of 1864. I mean, remember, the Civil War runs from 1861 to 1865. Well, unhappily for Abraham Lincoln, uh, 1864 is a constitutionally mandated election year. He's going to have to run for president. I mean, picture this. In the middle of a civil war, they're fighting tooth and nail. And suddenly, everyone has to stop and say, OK, time for election season. Well, we're going to have nominations, and we're going to have conventions, and we're going to have vote. If Lincoln had not had the commitment he had to democracy, would he not have simply stood up and said, look, folks, you know, there's a war on. Uh, let's get through the war first, then we'll worry about elections later. And that idea seems never to have occurred to him, even though in the summer of 1864, everything looked like he was going to lose that election. So it was, it was, it, the, the course of the war had been going badly. The economy was in shambles. There were protests over civil liberties violations and so on like that. And the Democratic opposition had nominated a very popular general, George B. McClellan, as, as his opponent. And what McClellan was suggesting was, look, you know, we've, we've had uh, three years of this war now. Uh, nothing has succeeded. Isn't it time to try negotiations with the Confederacy? And for a lot of people, that made sense. I mean, look, you know, if, if you've got a son, if you've got a husband, if you've got a father, you really want to see them sent off to Gettysburg or the Wilderness or, but worse still, to Andersonville? No. A lot of people listen, yeah, yeah, we've had enough of this war, enough bloodshed. And by the end of August 1864, Lincoln was convinced he was going to lose the election. And he writes this memorandum about, right, this is how I'm going to handle things when I lose. I'm going to cooperate with the president-elect. We're going to see if we can bring an end to the war as quickly as we can before he gets inaugurated, because once he's inaugurated, he's going to give the store away. Um, he, was he brings his cabinet and has them sign the back of this document. Doesn't let them read it, because he doesn't want to depress them, but he wants them to witness what he was thinking. So that no one afterwards can say, oh, well, you know, he was inventing a strategy. He's really convinced he's going to lose. And then, the end of August, you get to September, suddenly everything changes. Sherman captures Atlanta, 
there's a successful campaign in the Shenandoah Valley. Admiral Farragut captures Mobile Bay. And, and that, I mean, it's, it's like suddenly the air conditioning comes on. And he is able to go to a successful reelection in November of 1864. But he says to a group of well wishers who come to the White House after election day, he says, you know, we had to have this election. We had to take the chance of it. Because if, if we had canceled the election, it would be like handing the victory to the Confederates. It would be like saying to them, oh, you guys were right after all. Democracies don't work. So he was even willing to take that chance himself. And in the shape of something he does not do, which is cancel the election, he actually gives, I think, one of the most eloquent testimonies to his own confidence in democracy. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what was, uh, what was the score at the end of the game? Uh, 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 the, in the election of 64? The election of 64 turned out to be a landslide for Lincoln, really? especially in the Electoral College. Uh, poor George McClellan only got, if I'm remembering correctly, 12 electoral votes. He just did not do well. <laughs> What can I say? He was from New Jersey. You know. <laughs> he actually went on after the war to become governor of New Jersey. Uh, he's, he's buried in Trenton, uh, but he um, he did not he did he lost the election. I can't say that I'm sorry for him. All right, I'm, I do not like to think about what might have happened if Lincoln had been right at the end of August, 1864, because if McClellan had been elected. If McClellan had been elected, there's simply no question that as soon as he was inaugurated, it would have been an armistice, negotiations with the Confederacy. Well, the Confederates weren't going to negotiate. They had exactly one thing they wanted, and that was independence. And they, they weren't going to negotiate that. They weren't going to go back to fighting. I mean, after three years of this war, who's going to go back to fighting? Who really wants to? So everything that Lincoln had accomplished, including emancipation, would have gone right down the chute. We would have wound up as two independent nations, the United States and the Confederate States. And my guess is that it probably would have kept on fragmenting. We probably would have had a Great Lakes Confederacy. Uh, we probably, the, the, the Pacific Coast states would probably have gone on their own. And basically, would have, what we regard today as the United States of America would have ended up looking like the Balkans. And, and, if, and if it had, if it had, who would have stopped Imperial Germany in World War I? Who would have put up the hand to stop Hitler? Who would have put an end to the Cold War? Wouldn't have been the United States of America, because there wouldn't have been much of the United States of America. If, uh, if you would like to lie awake at night thinking about something, that's something that will keep you awake. I wish you would write political fiction the way you write science fiction, because that would be an extraordinary. Don't tempt me. <laughs> I'm tempting. <laughs> I often say that historians should not allow themselves to dabble in what ifs. And 95% of the time, I obey my own rule. But there is a 5% in which you can't help for thinking what if it had turned out a different way? And in some of those ways, it might have turned out not good to think about, not good to, and then you have to realize it almost happened. A turn of a dime could have been a very different set of results. Contingency in history is scary, but it's also a fact. All right, yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about the tension between uh, self-interest and virtue. What struck me was also the concept of the common good or the common wealth. I remember studying Pennsylvania history and William Penn, and he called it a common wealth. Right. And when I was in college, that was a concept in philosophy and other courses. But now you hardly hear anything about the common wealth or the common good. And you know, even 
you think about things like the highways, which I'm afraid from the cold weather of two weeks, we've got a lot of potholes. So our common wealth in the highways are crumbling. Could you comment on the, com the idea of the commonwealth, which, which takes us back, first of all, to the 17th century commonwealthsmen, you know, the English philosophers, of political philosophers of the 17th century. I'm thinking of people like James Harrington and so on like that. But even further beyond that to the republics of the Renaissance, the city republics of the Renaissance, and then beyond that to Republican Rome. There's always been this long history of concern for the common good. And a principal mark of statecraft has been its attention to the common good, not to, to individual constituencies, but to the common good, to ask what is good for all. Now, virtue tries to capture this idea of the commonwealth. And Lincoln's comment on that would be, yes, virtue, extremely important, but you cannot neglect self-interest. You have to appeal to self-interest too, because virtue is a tall mountain for human beings to climb. Self-interest is very different. Self-interest, we scramble. We want to get there. So Lincoln wants to say, is something right? All right, that is worth pursuing because it's good for everyone. But he also likes to make the appeal that says, will this do you good? Yes, scramble for it. So you see him constantly offering these two things. <clears throat> and to me, one of the classic examples is in a letter he writes in September of 1863 <clears throat> that is defending emancipation. And in that public letter, it was going to be read aloud at a mass meeting in Springfield, Illinois. <clears throat> in that letter, he's very careful to make an appeal to what is right, to what is virtuous. But at the same time, he also says, look, we have to make an appeal to self-interest, too. Um, do you want to save the union? Everyone wants to nod yes. Oh, yes, we want to save the union. All right. Then in that case, you should not be criticizing the emancipation of slaves the way you are doing it. Because, look, when those slaves are emancipated, they're going to be the first people to volunteer to join the army. And the army is what's going to preserve the union. So we're going to have virtue, but we're also going to have an appeal to self-interest. And Lincoln wants to work these two together. So he wants to be, on the one hand, he wants to be a moral philosopher. You know, he wants to be in the American context. He wants to be a John Witherspoon. But at the same time, he also wants to appeal to self-interest. He wants to be an Adam Smith. He thinks the two can be made to coincide. And maybe it is yet another mark of statecraft that those who really fill the role of leadership in the state are skilled enough in understanding human nature to know how to appeal to both without compromising either. Now, that, re that re it requires a certain philosophical finesse. We don't often associate politicians with philosophy. Oh my goodness, we certainly do not. Um, but when we have had great politicians, has it not been the case that they are, in fact, people schooled that way? Think of great politicians of the 20th century. I think of people like Conrad Adenauer. I mean, people today hardly even think about Conrad. He's, he's almost been forgotten in many quarters. Conrad Adenauer was at the same time a great politician. He was also a very insightful Catholic philosopher. And he, he intertwined those two together as he tried to rebuild Germany. Now, remember, Germany had a first attempt at rebuilding after World War I, and it fell to pieces. Look what it gave us. It gave us Hitler. Now, Adenauer, after World War II, has to do the same thing. This time, he knows he's got to get it right. But Adenauer was exactly the right man to do it. There was no counterpart to Adenauer in the Weimar Republic. I think also of Charles de Gaulle. I mean, Charles de Gaulle takes a France, which is busy. In 1945, France would, people in France would gladly have cut each other's throats over who had collaborated with the Nazis and who had not, and so on like that. And de Gaulle sets out, first of all, to make it clear, everybody was part of the resistance. 
That's the way we have to behave. That's the way we have to move forward. When he enters Paris in 1944, the first place he goes to, I mean, they're, they're taking this big parade down the Champs Elysees. Where is the first place he goes to to stop? He goes to Notre Dame, to the cathedral. He wants to make a statement here about the combination of the primacy of moral philosophy and together with practical politics. This was, this was a man, and most people do not know this, but de Gaulle, de Gaulle had one child, a daughter, and she, she was a special needs child. You know, she was, she was, you know, it, was, it was a mental disability. He loved her. He loved her. He's, he's a great politician, he's a great general, but at home, his love goes out to the child. Everywhere he goes, he's got his daughter with him. After she, she died at age 20, for the rest of his life, he kept a photograph of her in the pocket of his coat. You know, here is that meeting of the moral imperative with the practical politician that really makes for great statecraft. So we have seen things like this in our time. We have seen it in a John Paul II, all right? We have seen it. It can happen again. Maybe, just maybe, someone who is willing to take the direction and the example afforded by a Lincoln. Maybe someone sitting in this room is going to fill that role of genuine statecraft, that combination of moral philosophy with practical politics. And you think, well, how can that be? These guys are looking at each other fish-eyed, like, oh, what, what, who, me? <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm only a student here at a little university in Little Philadelphia. <laughs> what university did Lincoln graduate from? None. None, that's right. He came from Sinking Spring Farm in Kentucky. He came from the hardest of hard scrabble. He came from nothing. Someone once asked him, because he never, it's funny, we often like to talk about Abe Lincoln. Oh, he came up from the log cabin. Lincoln never liked to talk about his background because he was afraid people were going to try to use it to humiliate him. And someone, one of his neighbors, <laughs> tried to press him. Huh, you know, can you tell us about what it was like in your youth when you were growing up? He finally turned around and said, I have seen a great deal of the backside of the world. He didn't want to get into anything further. Yeah, he came up from the hardest of circumstances. But look where he went, and look who he brought with him, which is to say all of us. And if Lincoln, if we can have a Lincoln, we can also have more like a Lincoln. And as I say, maybe they're sitting in this very room. I hope so. More questions? Yes, sir. So in your previous answer, you mentioned sort of Lincoln's reference to the Union. And that, I think, is far more ubiquitous in his writings and in his speeches than democracy. And I'm thinking about the way in which he used it, particularly in his famous letter to Horace Greeley. Um, in your estimation, is he equating the Union with this concept of democracy? Or could there have been an extra paragraph in that letter in which he says, if I could save the Union and mm -hmm. abolish democracy, I would gladly do so? No, for him, for him these are non-negotiables. Because if you can't preserve the union, what that's really saying is that democracy doesn't work. Because democracy is the operating system of the union. If, if democracy goes down, the union goes down. Likewise, if the union goes down, that's a testimony to the fact that democracy really doesn't, doesn't uh, achieve its goals. That it's, a, that it's a bruised reed, and it's gonna bend and break on you when you put in any weight on it. And this is why he keeps saying all through the war, what am I trying to do in this war? I am trying to save the union. That's my primary task. And everything else is subordinate to that, even, even the abolition of slavery. Now, sometimes people respond to that, especially to the Greeley letter, and they say, well, see, he really didn't have his heart in emancipation. All he was trying to do was save the Union, as though that was unimportant. <laughs> so first of all, they, they fail to realize that if the Union is not saved, then the whole predicate of democracy has been shown to be a null set. I mean, it's like, it's like, trying, it's like trying to fill your, your gas tank with water. 
all right, you won't get far. Um, and if it turns out that democracy does not save the union, then that's proof positive that democracy is just water in the gas tank. The other thing about the Greeley letter, which I think a lot of people miss, they look at that and they see that he says, if I could save the union by freeing some of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the union by freeing none of the slaves, I would do that too. And people look at that and they say, oh, see, he really wasn't in earnest. And, and I want them to step back for a moment and think, okay, this is August of 1862. No president before Lincoln in his right mind would ever have dreamt of even hinting that he would emancipate slaves. And we miss that because Lincoln has this, he has this, this way of dropping a bomb in such a way that you just don't notice it's exploded. No, no president would, before Lincoln would ever have even faintly suggested that he had any intention of emancipating slaves. But in the Greeley letter, he says, well, you know, that's a oh, yeah, sure, I might emancipate the slaves. If you had been sitting there in late August 1862, you would have heard thump, 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 thump all through the building as people clutched their chests and fell over on the ground. Because it was just shocking. Like, he said what? He might do what? He can't do that. Well, you can imagine. That was the real impact of the Greeley letter. But once again, Lincoln, Lincoln always puts the fist inside a very soft velvet glove. And he does, he does it so often that it's, it's very easy to miss in Lincoln. But that is what he does with that. And he's really saying, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, if, you, if the Confederates keep pushing me, I'm going to do it still faster. So, yeah, for him, union. People often say he was interested in the union. He was not really interested in freeing slaves. No, for him, union and freeing slaves are two sides of the same coin. What's the, what's the point of saving the union? If, you're, if it's going to remain, if slavery is going to remain legal. But by the same token, how are you ever going to get rid of slavery if you don't restore the Union? If you don't restore the Union, the Confederacy is an independent, sovereign nation. You can't do anything about their internal life if they're an independent, sovereign nation. So you've got to restore the Union if you're, going to, if, you're, if you're going to get rid of slavery. Now, it's two sides of the same coin, but it's easy to miss because Lincoln has this extraordinary way of, of slipping the real message in when you're not entirely aware that it's being slipped. Other questions? Yes, sir. Could you comment on his suspending of habeas corpus mm -hmm. and uh, how he, how you would analyze that in view of his well, Clearly one of the most controversial decisions that he makes. And remember just some background this way. Uh, Lincoln suspends the writ of habeas corpus in April of 1861 after the outbreak of the war. Not just the outbreak of the war, but there have been riots in the city of Baltimore. Federal troops have been attacked in the streets of Baltimore. The Baltimore authorities will not intervene because they're sympathetic with secession. So. His response is to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. In other words, you can arrest people. The military can arrest people. It can put them in jail. They don't, ha they don't get a hearing. Or at least not a hearing until he's ready for them to have a hearing. And people raised their hands in horror and said, how can you suspend the writ of habeas corpus? Well, two reasons. One is the Constitution permits it. I mean, the Constitution says in Article I, the writ of habeas corpus, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in cases of invasion or rebellion. Lincoln looked at that and said, uh, this is a rebellion. So the writ of habeas corpus can be suspended. The writ of habeas corpus is not a get out of jail free card. And Lincoln understood that. So he suspends the writ. In fact, he'll suspend it several times during the course of the Civil War. Now, the second question that attaches itself there is, did he have the authority as president to do it? Because the clause for suspending the writ of habeas corpus is in Article I of the Constitution, which is about Congress. 
So the logical assumption you might have is that it's Congress which should authorize the suspension of the writ. Yeah, except that it doesn't exactly say that in Article I. It simply says the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except it doesn't say who's supposed to do it. In fact, that provision about suspending the writ actually originally was located in one of the later articles. And only at just about the last minute at the Constitutional Convention was the bit about suspending the writ transferred and put into Article I. So Lincoln says, look, technically speaking, if we're going just by the letter of constitutional law, suspending the writ of habeas corpus is not something which is confined solely to Congress. Now, the other consideration here is, is the immediate situation he was in. I mean, not only was there, well, there were riots, Congress was out of session. The previous Congress, the 36th Congress, had adjourned on the 4th of March, 1861. And the Senate stayed in session until the end of the month, but after March 30th, that's gone too. The Civil War breaks out two weeks later with the firing on Fort Sumter. And then a few days after that, the riots in Baltimore occur. Um, if Congress was the only body authorized to suspend the writ, what was he going to do? Now you might say, well, he should call Congress into session. Wait a minute. The next Congress, the 37th Congress, has not finished its election cycle yet. Now we think of an election cycle as being totally uniform. It's every November. That's a much later development in American electoral politics. In 1861, every state set its own election cycle for Congress. And at that moment, in April and May of 1861, Two vital border states had not yet held their congressional election. So he would be calling the 37th Congress into special session without these two critical border states, Maryland and Kentucky, which he can't, I mean, he knows he can't, if he does that, they're going to they're join the Confederacy. Yet he knows he has to act himself. So he does. He shinnies out on a constitutional limb, and he strictly appeals to the exact wording of the clause about habeas corpus. Now, he calls for a special session of the 37th Congress, but he doesn't call it to meet until the 4th of July, 1861. Why? Because he wants to get those elections taking place. That way, nobody, when Congress does come into special session, nobody can afterwards say, oh, well, this isn't a legitimate Congress. But he has, he has to act then, because what's he going to do? Sit on his hands until the 4th of July? Let the Confederates run rampant over Maryland? I mean, think about this. Suppose Maryland goes Confederate. Suppose the Maryland legislature decides it wants to secede. Think about this. That means the capital of the United States is in the middle of another country. Because it's going to be surrounded on three sides by Maryland and on the other side by Virginia, which was already in the Confederacy. Um, if he had sat around and let that happen, why wouldn't everybody in Congress have jumped up when it finally came together and demanded his impeachment? And he knows that. So he takes a step, and he knows he's on some thin ice. But he takes the step because he doesn't really believe there's any, any real alternative. So that is the larger context for suspending the writ. Now, does this mean he then turns into a one-man dictatorship. Over the course of the Civil War, it has been calculated that there were between 13 and 14,000 civilian arrests. Now, in a population of 22 million in the North, that's not exactly a night of the long knives. All right, but it's still, that's, that's civil liberties questions right there. You're arresting people, putting them in jail, and not giving them a hearing. All right, he does that, but of that th between 13 and 14,000, only about 800 are actually civil cases. The rest are smugglers, blockade runners, people who are you know, people conducting guerrilla warfare in the border states. So when you come right down to it, he, he, the actual number of people who are involved in what could be construed as civil liberties violations, 
is vanishingly small. In the middle of a crisis of those dimensions and a population as big as the North was in the Civil War. Lincoln himself said in 1863, in response to a question about this, he said, my, my, my guess is that in time to come, people will fault me for not having done more than what I actually have done. But I, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to look at Lincoln and say, oh, well, these terrible civil liberties violations. Well, yeah, there were. there were. Not that he was directly responsible for all of them anyway, but there were civil liberties violations. They were dense in, they were, they were dense in the fender of, of American civil liberties, but they were not more than dense. And once the war was over, we went right back to the same conditions of freedom and democracy that we had enjoyed before. If Lincoln had really done all that much damage through suspending the writ to civil liberties and to democracy, then I have to ask by what magic powder did we somehow recover all of our use of those civil liberties once the Civil War was over? Uh, and I think the answer really comes down to where there were dents, where there were problems. And there were. I'm not trying to tell you that Lincoln was perfect. He did not walk across the Potomac. But, all right, at the same time, I'm also saying what is remarkable about him is in the conduct of this terrible Civil War, for which there were no precedents, in American experience. I mean, he couldn't go into the bookstore and buy Civil Wars for Dummies, okay? Doesn't happen. He's, he's, he's got to improvise this day by day. And the remarkable thing is how, how remarkable gentle, gen, remarkably gentle the improvisation was. So that's a very long answer, but it's a very complicated issue, but a very good issue. In fact, I've got a, next month I have to address a convention of Pennsylvania state judges, Commonwealth judges, and the topic I've been assigned to talk to the judges is suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. <laughs> so you can see, I'm, you know, I'm kind of armed and dangerous on the subject. <laughs> All right, Mark, how, how, are, we, how are we doing? We're going to find the time. Um, one or two more questions. Let's, let's take one more question, then we'll, uh, then we'll call it a night and people, have, people can... Uh... We do have some refreshments outside. Oh, that's good. Oh, that makes it even more attractive. <laughs> Is there another question? Ah, all right. Yes, please. Go ahead. So the federal government restored full civil rights, but obviously we know in you know, post-Confederate South, it was pretty much immediately... Right. Um, and so I just... I was wondering if you could comment on that. Like, is that because of the difference between like the federal government and state governments? Or? Not really. It's more a matter of who is in charge at the federal level. And once the Civil War is over, it's not Lincoln. And Lincoln is shot on the 14th of April, 1865, dies the next morning. His successor is his vice president. One of the has to be said, least distinguished vice presidential selections ever made, Andrew Johnson. Johnson simply did not possess any of Lincoln's political savvy. He just did not. He, he makes a tremendous botch of Reconstruction. And by the time he leaves office in March of 1869, Reconstruction has already gone off the rails. Ulysses Grant, who succeeds him as president, tries his best to get it back up and running, but by that point, the, the horse was out of the stable. People probably ask me more often than any other question, what would have happened if Lincoln had lived? Well, he certainly would, have done, would not have done worse than Johnson did in Reconstruction. I think we can say that with some authority. I think there are a number of things he would have done. Now, I'm saying I think, so I'm doing this very thing about what if questions I always say we shouldn't do. I think he would have put his shoulder to the wheel about black voting rights for practical as well as moral reasons. I think he would have been willing to talk about the redistribution of some Confederate land, especially the land owned by big Confederate officials. What he hoped at the end of the war was that the Confederate leadership would leave and go into exile. He did not want show trials. He, he made this gesture like shooing chickens in a yard, like, yeah, let them go, let them go. And what would happen to their property? Well, it quite conceivably, he could have sanctioned the dividing up of that property. General Sherman tried to do something like that. 
in the Sea Islands in South Carolina uh, toward the end of the war. I think he certainly would have tried to encourage the bringing up of a new political generation in the South that would lay aside the venom of secession and hatred. But he never got a chance to do that, so we don't know. And in, in some senses, we also have to concede that perhaps the problems of Reconstruction might have been more than even a Lincoln could have solved. Uh, because those, I mean, the problems of the Civil War were difficult enough. But the problems of Reconstruction were, if anything, even more formidable. So at the end of the day, I can suggest some things, but understand I'm qualifying it severely with the word suggest. We really do not know what might have happened if Lincoln had lived. And it might have been tremendously different. Maybe those problems, though, would have been so intractable uh, that even a Lincoln would have found them impossible to solve. We just don't know. So is the problem more that he just didn't have enough time to finish out his vision? Or is, it, or is the problem the separation between institutions mm -hmm. and the federal and state level? No, I think he knew, I mean, he understood very well the difference between the federal and the state level. This is curious because the Confederacy, the Confederacy ostensibly goes to war on behalf of state rights. And as soon as the Confederacy declares its independence, state rights disappear. Um, Jefferson Davis never convenes the governors of the states to take their opinion on, on matters. Whereas Lincoln convenes governors of the northern states eight times during the Civil War. Lincoln, in that respect, is much, much more respectful of the federal-state dividing line than Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy was. It's a real irony, but, but there it is. Um, I don't think the problem is so much the dividing line between state and federal as it is the question of leadership at the very top of the federal government. And Andrew Johnson was just the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just no two ways about it. All right, Mark, do you have any closing comments for us? Uh, no, thank you very much.